In today's episode, we'll be focusing on product and innovation. Later on, we'll hear from Charlie Beckett, a professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics, Agnes Stenbaum, a responsible data and AI specialist in Sweden, and Christina Elmer, editorial R&D at Der Spiegel in Germany on how AI is transforming newsrooms. But first, we'll hear from Brad Bender, Vice President of Product at Google. Brad is a global lead overseeing product and design and strategy for news. We'll join him for a conversation with British broadcaster Tina Dehealy on the future of news. Let's join the conversation. Hi, I'm Tina Dehealy and I'm here with Brad from Google. Brad is VP of Google News Products, where he's global lead overseeing product design and strategy. This includes News on Search, the Google News app, uh, Tools for Journalists, and so much more. Brad, welcome. Thanks so much, Tina. It's uh, great to be with you today. Now, Brad, I read that your CEO, Sundar Pichai, is something of a news junkie. Tell me about your own news habits. Why does news matter to you? Sure. Uh, the, the future of news is both a uh, personal and a uh, professional mission for me. Uh, my wife is actually a journalist, and uh, that means, you know, it's our dinner table conversation. Uh, and it, it also means that I'm acutely aware of uh, the challenges that journalism is currently facing, as well as the many exciting changes that the industry is going through. Um, I've also worked with news publishers for a long time uh, in my previous roles on the ad side of the business and today on the product side, building new experiences and working in partnership with publishers on news. And it's been heartening to see the demand for journalism continue to grow. But of course, in my professional capacity, I'm also acutely aware of how the business of creating journalism has fared over the years. You know, pressure coming first from radio and then TV, and of course today, the internet, which is the latest, but it, it certainly won't be the last advance to put pressure on the business. I remember uh, growing up in Brooklyn, uh, we used to get the New York Times delivered to the door. Uh, and I still remember sitting down with my mother doing the crossword puzzle on the weekend. Uh, she's always much better than me, uh, by the way. She used to do it in pen. Um, <laughs> but of course, now with digital, uh, you don't need to wait for the paper to arrive uh, to get your news of the day. Uh, it's so much more immediate nowadays with news available on your phone. And you know, today I'd say the place I get most of my news is the Google News app. And I'm also subscribed to a few local and regional publications. But I'm reminded um, of the moments in my life where it was clear how critical news was. You know, whether it was living in New York City during 9-11 or uh, trying to navigate a blackout uh, shortly after my twin daughters were born when the power didn't come on for a week. In those real moments of need, news becomes personal uh, and indeed you know, vital uh, in helping people stay up to date with fast moving stories in order to make informed decisions that could affect their health and well-being. And that's a big part of what motivates me. The impact of COVID on the news industry has been brutal. Thousands of people have lost their jobs or been furloughed. Newspapers have closed or reduced their coverage because of the economic implications of the pandemic. How has COVID-19 impacted the way you and Google think about news and journalism? Information is at the heart of our mission. Uh, you know, and helping people get access to uh, authoritative sources is paramount in these situations. You know, and COVID is only underlying the importance of that mission. Uh, the demand for quality journalism has never been higher, yet, you know, the business side of journalism is challenged in unimaginable ways. You know, and COVID has only accelerated the pressure on publishers to transition to an increasingly digital world. Um, one publisher said that COVID has shrunk the timeline of that transition from three to five years to more like three to five months. But 
the worst of times can bring out the best in people. Uh, I saw this firsthand at Google as uh, people around the company came together to brainstorm how we could help people, help the industry, and really make a difference. Um, and that's where the idea of the Journalism Emergency Relief Fund came from. It was our way to get dollars into the hands of small publishers around the world as quickly as possible, who were under a great deal of strain due to COVID. In the space of a couple of months, uh, the Google News Initiative paid out nearly $40 million to over 5,600 small and medium-sized publishers. And these newspapers and newsrooms used the money for reporting on the pandemic, uh, buying safety equipment, uh, growing subscriptions. Um, one example that really touched me was at the Milton Times, where they dedicated the funding to the publication of stories of kindness and heroism during this time. Um, other parts of the company pitched in too. Our ads uh, business provided a five month waiver on fees for Google Ad Manager that helped over 700 publishers worldwide. Uh, Google Marketing made a hundred million dollar commitment to spend with news publishers over the space of the year. And we launched a $15 million support local news campaign to pay for ads in local papers in the United States and Canada to persuade people to subscribe, donate, and advertise to their local publications. And then on the product side, we built uh, custom experiences to really help connect people to news about COVID. That included a fact check feature as well as a focus on local content. You know, people really pulled out all the stops to get these efforts off the ground. And it was really inspiring to see. Just speaks to how we feel about the importance of news as a company. Brad, what changes do you think are still to come in the industry? I think uh, the transition to digital uh, will continue to accelerate. Uh, we're we're as part of that, I think we're going to continue to see um, pressure on ads monetization. Hybrid monetization models are going to become increasingly important to publishers. You know, as more and more publishers find success with things like reader revenue and licensing. Um, you know, and with these hybrid models, uh, success really rests on how good the experience and the product is for your users. And that's especially true in digital. So the industry is going to need to continue adapting to the new and emerging consumption habits that we're seeing with users. You know, publishers need to lean in to these shifts in order to be there for their users. And this goes beyond servicing users. Um, it's really about listening, learning, and uh, gathering continuous feedback from them. Um, we're seeing this with the recent innovation in uh, audio news and uh, visual story experiences many publishers are leaning into. You know, this was really driven by an understanding of, you know, how news consumption among Generation Z has been changing and evolving. You know, there are now more than two and a half billion Gen Zers globally. Uh, they've overtaken millennials. And research shows that the way that they consume news is different than the general population. Since birth, they've been inundated with news and ways to access it. Uh, they view Instagram and YouTube uh, as being as important as CNN in where they access their news. And they value articles, video, photos, and audio equally. Therefore, to stand out in the market, uh, we've seen many publishers experimenting and leaning into things like podcasts, as well as other visual formats. You know, for example, 73% of digital native news outlets release podcasts. So with this consumption model in mind, um, we launched our audio news product. Uh, that's called Your News Update. It, it, it launched last year. And, and we paid publishers to provide content for this new space in the market. And then on the visual side, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we launched Web Stories and Discover, uh, which is bringing the best visual content from around the web for a more immersive experience. I believe this deep focus on the user is critical for the industry to adapt. At Google, we put the user experience at our core and our understanding of users and openness to experiment is really what's helped us in our continual support of the news industry and these evolving uh, consumption habits. 
Google made the headlines recently with the announcement of a of a one billion dollar investment in news partnerships that include a new product called Google News Showcase. What's the thinking behind that, and, and what exactly is Google paying for? Um, we've worked with news publishers for more than twenty years, um, and over that time, you know, we've increased the ways that we support the industry as it continues to grapple with this transition uh, to the digital world. Uh, and we've said it often, um, we are committed to playing our part to help the industry thrive, you know, alongside other companies, governments, publishers, and uh, civic society. And this announcement you mentioned takes our commitment to the future of news to a new level. Um, this initial billion dollar investment over three years includes paying for content for a new online news experience called Google News Showcase. And we just launched the product in Germany and Brazil. And the goal is to give readers more context and journalistic perspective on stories. Um, for publishers, Showcase also enables their brand to stand out and their distinct editorial voice to shine through. It also gives them an opportunity to build deeper relationships with users of Google products. And we'll be launching in other countries over time. We, we've actually signed more than 200 publications covering countries like Italy, Canada, Argentina, India, the UK, and Australia, as well as others. Uh, I'm, I'm truly delighted how the program's taking off. Um, New Showcase has been a very different approach for Google from a product standpoint. Uh, it's a new way uh, for to us to help our users connect to stories that matter. It's a significant step forward in how we worked with partners to develop it. We had an early access program where we worked closely with many publishers to get their feedback and insights that helped shape the product experience. And of course, it's a new way for Google to support the future of quality journalism with our biggest investment ever. You know, this deep collaboration has been amazing for us and it's something we're really serious about. I think we'd all agree that news is fundamentally important to democracies and societies, but given what's happened between COVID and privacy, the ad side of the business has faced challenges. How do you view your role in this context? Yeah, we see our role as that of a collaborative partner to news publishers. Uh, like I said, we have a 20, over 20 year long history with publishers and, and we're in this for the long haul, you know, as demonstrated by um, our recent announcement we just discussed to invest a billion dollars in news partnerships for News Showcase. It's clear that the business model for news that worked 40 years ago has changed dramatically, right? It was challenged back in the day by radio and then TV, and of course, later on by the internet. Hard news itself has also been tough to monetize traditionally. And we know this firsthand. Uh, News isn't a business driver for Google. We don't have ads on Google News or news mode and search. You know, the fact is that the old model of classified ads that paid for hard news has moved online to sites like uh, Craigslist. Um, you know, there, there was a study done in Australia that showed between uh, 2002 and 2018, newspaper revenues fell $1.4 billion and 92% of that decline was from the loss of classifieds. And most of these classifieds revenue weren't actually captured by Google, but by online pure plays, digital only businesses that target specific, specific niches, you know, such as job advertisements, secondhand goods, or real estate listings. In fact, online search revenues have primarily grown through the overall advertising market growth. But over the years, we've worked to find different ways to drive value to the news industry. Um, sending people to publishers news sites you know, not keeping them walled up on Google products is a key way we do that. Every month, our news products send Google users to news sites 24 billion times. Um, and that, that provides an opportunity for publishers to grow their audiences, show those users ads, or entice them to sign up for a subscription. Uh, Deloitte actually puts the value of each click for large publishers at roughly between four and seven cents. But whatever value you put on those visits, you know, there's real monetary value to publishers from those visits. Um, we also invest in uh, ad technologies that thousands of news publishers around the world choose to use 
to grow their digital advertising businesses. Um, we analyzed the revenue data of 100 news publishers globally with the highest programmatic revenue generated in Google Ad Manager. And on average, we found that news publishers keep over 95% of the digital advertising revenue they generate when they use Ad Manager to show ads on their websites. And uh, we just released our first impact report for the Google News Initiative, which shows that over the last two years, we've provided support to more than 6,250 news partners in 118 countries through 189 million in global funding, programs, tools, and resources. Um, so I hope all these efforts, you know, and more that I haven't even mentioned, you know, speak to our commitment to the industry and uh, to our users. It's clear from this conversation that Google is highly motivated to support the news industry, but why does Google care? Uh, information is at the heart of our mission, uh, but it's more than that. Um, information plays a role in how we connect to one another. It, it plays a role in how we connect to our communities. You know, and we've seen this every day in the midst of the pandemic, you know, people being able to find out uh, the latest information on COVID cases, uh, where the nearest testing center is, um, or what's happening with their local school openings. Um, helping, helping people through this has been um, incredibly important. Um, but helping people get access to news from authoritative sources is also important for democracies and open societies. It empowers people, it, it helps communities thrive. Um, we know this is a challenging time uh, for the news industry, uh, but we've shown over the years that, you know, we want to play our part in helping build a better future for news. Uh, at the same time, I think we have to recognize some realities. Um, you know, as we've chatted about, the industry has faced challenges for decades, you know, first from radio, then television, most recently from the Internet. Uh, you know, and the Internet's dramatically transformed. Um, the media environment and change where each of us goes for timely information. You know, the number of channels that advertisers can spend their money on has proliferated. Uh, advertisers are target spending against, you know, content categories that are contextually relevant to their products, as well as where people are spending their time. And all of these challenges have only been compounded uh, by the pandemic. So as the world becomes more digital, you know, these dynamics are just putting increasing pressure on publishers who are in various states of transitioning to digital themselves. Uh, we can't turn the clock back uh, to a time before the internet existed. Instead, I think we, we all need to look forward um, toward a more sustainable news industry. Uh, and to do that requires the participation of many. Um, that involves companies like Google, um, alongside governments, policymakers, uh, other companies, and, and of course, publishers themselves. We wanna be involved in that conversation and support a process that leads to rules of the road that are fair for all and helps publishers achieve a sustainable and diverse business. At the end of the day, I really believe that by working together, we can all help build a better future for news. So I think the thing that excites me, even though it kind of maybe feels a little bit double-edged is that because things are tough, there is now a recognition that journalism needs to change, adapt and innovate to survive. And whilst that is tough, and there are definitely moments right now that feel very, very challenging, I think there's also a kind of an excitement that this, in order to survive, journalism need to think, needs to think differently. And we've seen some examples of news startups, nonprofits, people doing different things that 10 years ago would have been kind of laughed off. So that's what's exciting to me, which is, um, is going to adapt and I think that that's great and necessary. I think what I am most excited about is innovation. I think like most industries that go through a phase of disruption, I think as challenging and as uncomfortable as that change is, I think that it will lead to more creative ways of serving readers of producing content, distributing that content and monetizing that content. So I think we will see quite a bit of innovation around 
all of those areas. And I think ultimately that is going to lead to better service for our readers, a more flexible and supportive work environment for our journalists and everyone else who is involved in creating quality content. But also I think that it would mean that the content that readers get is going to need to be of incredibly high quality. The closer you get to your end user, who I think for the most part is discerning and demanding, the more you need to invest in creating really powerful, high quality content for them and to compete successfully. I think one of the most exciting things about the news, the future of media, the larger information landscape is the way I see the role of data into storytelling. Essentially the information, the role of information, which is coming into different forms of data now. I see for the first time in the human history, we have reached to a stage perhaps where we don't need to collect more information. Perhaps we need people, the storytellers, who can make sense of already existed information and try to analyze it, try to shape it, try to clean it, try to visualize it, try to make it, we try to make it open for public so that they can understand it. So I, th I think this is one thing which I personally, if you ask me, I think that I see as a huge, huge uh, phenomenal uh, a shift which would open new spaces for news rooms, which would open new spaces for storytellers, particularly with the role of AI coming into a larger ecosystem of news. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. This is the Google News Initiative conversation about journalism AI, our partnership with the London School of Economics about the future of AI in the newsroom. I'm extremely happy to be surrounded today by three experts in the field, uh, Agnes Stembaum, Christina Elmer, and Professor Charlie Beckett. Welcome to all of you. Uh, and maybe as a first question, um, I would like to ask you what prompted you uh, to this field, to AI, machine learning, um, and what really interested you in joining this uh, partnership? So my name is Agnes Stembom and I work for the Nordic media group Shibstead. I have a background in product development and machine learning, and I am now the responsible data and AI specialist at Shibstead. It is a fluffy title, I'm well aware of it, but what it means in practice is that I work with different strategic initiatives related to how and why we use AI across our brands. I'm also doing a PhD at Kiltilich Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, where I focus specifically on AI in newsrooms. And there my goal is to help identify sustainable strategies for the future for our industry. And surprise, the Journalism AI Collab is such an exciting platform in that regard. So for me personally and for Shipset generally, um, it was a must join. Yes, um, my name is Christina Elmer. I'm working for Der Spiegel in Hamburg um, in the editorial R&D team. And I'm there responsible for all the AI integrations that we have in the newsroom. My background is in data journalism, so I'm also really interested in these topics uh, for some years now. And I think that AI is a great example of the gap between industry promises on the one hand and editorial reality on the other. And it's really, really interesting to try to bridge that gap by um, smart solutions. And the Journalism AI Collab has been a really good chance to, to do this. So um, yeah, it was no question uh, for me to join as well. Thanks, Christina. Uh, Charlie, uh, so you're a professor at the London School of Economics. You're really the uh, master of this program. Can you tell us a few words as well about uh, your interest in, in AI and how you came to this uh, field? Well, for me, it was because this um, seemed to me the third wave of technological change in journalism. Uh, my work at the LSE is all about the future of news and how uh, it's changing. And it just seemed to me that after the whole thing of going online, is uh, going onto the internet, which I remember when I was a journalist myself back at the BBC, uh, and then there was this uh, wave of social media, and it seemed to me that AI um, is different in itself and really important 
uh, and it's all about how it might change journalism for good or bad. So it seemed absolutely vital to, to look at it and absolutely vital to do that uh, with the journalists themselves. Great. So what, one of the first lines you wrote in the Journalism AI survey, the global survey that you published last year, Charlie, is that robots are not going to take over journalists. Uh, so I was curious about uh, the way Christina and Agnes um, feel about this prediction. Yeah, I absolutely agree with this uh, prediction, um, because in my view, journalism is more about creativity, um, asking the right question to the right person at the right time, for example. And I think for journalism to re resonate with humans, um, it cannot be done without humans in the end. You have to really... Um, combine um, those technical solutions with um, human workforce in the newsroom, for example, we will have, I think, hybrid uh, processes in the end. And this will be great for the journalists in the end, because there will be many repetitive tasks that we won't have to do uh, anymore. I hope um, that this will be the future, yeah. Thanks, Christina. Do you agree, Agnes? Yeah, I fully agree with both Charlie and Christina. I think many in and beyond the newsroom are scared of losing their jobs to AI. Uh, but what I firmly believe is that we need to shift that logic and start thinking about how newsroom tasks, news jobs will evolve with AI by our side and at our convenience. So I do think that the role of journalists will change. And for some people, that change will be significant. But as I see it, we have to shift our logic and our way of looking at journalists as the producer of journalistic output to instead viewing them as designers of journalistic processes. In these processes, I think computational systems like AI will be key subordinates working according to the processes designed by journalists and by editors. Christina mentioned hybrid and hybrids, a frequently discussed concept in academia, which I'm a part of. Uh, that's hybridization. So basically what that term represents in this discussion is the idea of merging or mixing human and machine expertise, uh, creating journalistic output together. So if we, if we are to become this hybrid force where the skills of both humans and machines are leveraged, I think it's, uh, it's just like Christina says, it's really important that we recognize all the uniquely human skills that journalists do possess. In doing so, I think we need to practice decomposition, uh, breaking down huge news projects into smaller tasks and see which of those could actually be done by an AI or some other computational approach. Yeah, and it brings us to another key insight from um, uh, Charlie's um, survey, which, which is that uh, only actually a few newsrooms globally have a proper AI strategy. Um, Charlie, maybe can you elaborate on, on this finding? Yeah, I mean, when we did the survey, uh, I think it was only about a third of uh, the newsrooms um, said they had any kind of strategy to deal with things like automation and machine learning. Uh, and in a way, that's not surprising. It's still relatively emerging technology, and newsrooms have got a bundle of other problems that they're dealing with at the moment. But what was really apparent when we started talking to the newsrooms about the potential of AI was the realization that this isn't just a one-off event, this isn't just a single tool, it's a whole systematic structural uh, process. And so, you know, if you are going to use it, uh, then you have to think about it in a systematic way. And that means thinking longer term about the research and the skills and the knowledge uh, that you've got in your news. I mean, what do you want to do with this, this thing? It will take time to implement and to see the results. So you have to have some sense uh, of strategy about it. And we're really pleased to see that people are starting to think their way uh, forward on that. Christina, do you agree with this approach? And, and maybe what would be your advice to, to newcomers to this field? Mm -hmm. um, I would, of, of course, agree uh, to that. It needs a systematic approach to implement AI solutions into newsroom processes. But I would not necessarily think that we really need an AI strategy in every newsroom. Um, I think the knowledge um, when it um, comes to data literacy, algorithmic literacy, AI literacy is much more important because 
in the end, I think uh, we all will have to work in hybrid structures with AI systems. So we have to understand what they can and what they cannot do um, and how to, um, how to assess their results, for example. Um, I think it's never too late uh, to start doing this because there are so many solutions that you can, um, can already use, uh, for example, for transcribing audio, um, audio pieces or for re-sorting comments uh, in your forum, for example. So um, you can really start small. But then it's really important not only to have the experts in the newsroom, but also to to lift the level of um, knowledge um, overall, because otherwise people will be working with AI and not really understanding what this is, uh, what yeah, what the AI systems do in the background. Um, and I would also say that you have to be aware of the cultural side of this development, because the, the change is really fundamental. Uh, in a way that we have to think about our journalism in a more workflow uh, style way um, and we have to think about processes and in so many newsrooms there isn't a deep understanding of processes so we are all doing our artwork <laughs> and it's not mm. it's not certain steps of, of work uh, where we can really take one step out and give it to the AI system and this would be needed I think so um, I think it's a, a, a huge transformation and it's so much about knowledge, not only concerning the AI systems, but also um, the workflows and the structures and systems. Very good point about uh, AI literacy in newsroom, actually. And that was mm -hmm. one of the first uh, tasks that Charlie and his team um, uh, did, which was to put together a training, a proper training, introducing AI and machine learning to journalists. Mm -hmm. And it's available on uh, the Google News Initiative Training Center. Um, Agnes, uh, do you agree? And what would be your, also your advice to um, newsrooms that might be intimidated a little bit by um, AI and machine learning, how to get uh, jump into it? No, I, I fully agree with what has been said. I think knowledge and an increased awareness of AI in newsrooms is absolutely critical. I think the journalism AI collab and the platform itself is a great opportunity to learn and I think it comes at this critical point for us as an industry. While I do appreciate all the wonderful uh, tools and platforms just like the journalism AI collab um, that big tech is uh, sponsoring and, and taking the initiative to run, uh, I believe that the news media industry is at a critical point in our technological and market developments where power has to at least partially get back with the publishers. I think we put ideals like democracy, freedom of speech at risk if we allow for a few global companies to control implicitly or explicitly the global information flows. So as AI evolves, I think it's uh, critical that news media organizations take ownership uh, over these technologies and, and joins the conversation uh, practically and theoretically around how we want these tools to be used. I see the irony and the complexity of the journalism AI Cola being funded by the GNI, but I think it's also uh, a great opportunity to join forces and discuss, just like we're doing now, uh, across organizational boundaries, across industrial boundaries as well. Uh, so I think I really appreciate uh, getting to know you, David, and the rest of my industry peers. And you asked for a piece of advice, and I'd say that that would be to take ownership. Uh, anyone in the newsroom, in society really, will be affected by AI. It's not a development that's only happening in the technological departments. Uh, so I think we all have skin in the game. We all have a reason to join the conversation, join the table. So uh, take ownership and, and do have your say in how we use these tools. True, and it, it also was uh, a very important finding of um, uh, the Journalism AI survey, uh, the need for strong ethical framework um, for example, at Google, we have defined early on in 2018 a set of AI principles uh, to guide our work, uh, like, for example, being socially beneficial, um, avoid creating or reinforcing bias. Um, how should we collectively, and you mentioned uh, the tech platform and the industry in general, new, newsrooms, uh, academia as well, how should we collectively proceed in the field of uh, journalism and AI to maintain these very high standards? Um, maybe Charlie to start with. 
Yeah, well, well, I think ethics is is something that we've become aware of around algorithms and data. We think about privacy, we think about bias, um, but perhaps we haven't been thoughtful enough about that, how that works with journalism. And you know, I'm delighted that one of the collab teams is actually working uh, on a project thinking about how you might actually use AI to counter uh, biases within newsrooms. So that's really uh, interesting. Um, but I think it's important that it's not just seen as um, a kind of moral issue around, you know, for example, gender discrimination or possible racial discrimination within algorithms. It's also a vital issue for the newsrooms themselves, because like any technology, any change, it's going to have an impact on editorial policies, for example, and the relationship, perhaps most importantly, with the public with the people who consume your journalism. So it's really important that journalists understand the tech and think through the ethical or editorial implications that it's going to bring uh, to their work, because they've got choices uh, to make, human choices to make, social choices to make around this uh, technology and how it works. Christina, do you subscribe to this point of view? Yeah, t totally agree. I think it's it's really an educational um, problem or a challenge uh, at this point. And coming from data journalism, for example, um, I mean, we've also done some algorithmic account accountability reporting projects. And as I see it in these projects, we are really asking the same questions that we have to ask when we are using or building AI systems uh, ourselves. Mm -hmm. So um, this is, I think this is the good news uh, for newsrooms that um, I think the education in this field is not only helpful when it comes to um, working with AI or building up hybrid structures, for example, but you also need it in the day-to-day -day reporting. Um, and it's increasingly important uh, in this field. So um, it's really, it's overall so, so useful to uh, bring people um, to a certain level of algorithmic knowledge and AI knowledge at this point. So. Um, and I think the ethical questions um, come up uh, all the way um, when you do the reporting and all the way when you think about how to, how to really use um, the systems in your newsroom, but you first have to understand what they are doing. Um, and this is also why collaboration is so important, because we have to really collaborate with our industry partners um, to get this kind of understanding, because in the end, of course, um, much of what is happening in, in AI systems is a black box, but um, we, we can try to understand the principles behind it, of course. And so, so I think collaboration is not only key when it comes to, to the network, but also uh, when it comes to new partnerships. And I think this is also a new thing for the industry as well, um, to build up trust in these um, collaboration. Right. Agnes, do you want to add something or maybe can you give us an example where you really, in you, within your practice, had some sort of ethical um, dilemma or question to, to ask? Well, just to add to what's already been said, I think we should remember and celebrate that journalism is exceptionally well positioned to use AI in responsible ways. We are an industry of practice that inquires. We have established codes of conduct. We work to serve society. I think that at this point in development, we need to understand and then communicate the link between AI and our publishing mission, and show our teams how these tools can be a way to actually work towards them to further our missions in society. I think with that kind of awareness and the skills to act upon it, with that in place, we're even better positioned to use AI in ways that, that helps deliver on our already set mission. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. When it comes to a ethical dilemma uh, where, we are, where AI can help us, um, I think for me, I, I view AI as a hugely potential source for information democrat democratization. Um, I think there's so many ways that we can use these tools to make sense of the world uh, and ensure that all kinds of people can make sense of the world. And there, I think, we'll be facing uh, lots of interesting questions and challenges. Uh, for whom uh, will we use AI to serve uh, with information? 
Um, I can't think of a, a practical example, but I'm, I'm preparing myself for, for interesting challenges in that regard. Fascinating. So all of you have mentioned collaboration, actually, and journalism AI collab in particular, which is this effort of more than 20, 20 newsrooms now um, joining forces to try and solve a collaboratively uh, a common challenge. Um, I've always been very surprised that in this particular field where the expertise is scarce um, and, and the investment, including financial investment, is important, um, one could have expected a great competitiveness um, more than collaboration, uh, but actually there's a strong appetite for collaboration. How do you explain that, uh, which I think is extremely uh, positive and, and exciting? Uh, Charlie within the, the, the scope of your survey, yeah. how did you come up with this uh, finding and how did you materialize it? Well, it was there in the survey um, that people were much more open-minded. I mean, as an ex-journalist myself, we're ferociously competitive amongst ourselves and very independently minded. Um, but it, it was there in the survey that people were opening their minds. And then in this uh, project ourselves, especially obviously with this collab process, I have really had my socks knocked off, to be honest, because in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of an economic crisis, with all the problems uh, these people are facing, they've devoted time, but more importantly, huge amounts of energy uh, and intellectual endeavour to working with a bunch of people from very different news organisations around the world to try and problem solve. And the reason they're doing it is partly because it's really good fun, uh, but also because it's a really good way to think in a fresh way about these complex ideas. We can't do it on our own. There are very few newsrooms with the resources to really get across all this technology. And so we're building these fantastic relations between newsrooms, but also with other players like, you know, me at a university or the tech companies or startups or other people. And I think this is perhaps in a way it's been the most refreshing, exciting part of this uh, whole project. And I think that speaks a lot about the future of the news industry, that we can't just be in our little silos anymore. We can't just be culturally um, isolated anymore. And, and I do think that's been, yeah, as I say, the most fun, but possibly the most uh, productive looking forwards uh, that's come out of this whole uh, process. Yeah, Christina, was it spontaneous as well for you to join the collab, like uh, something extremely obvious? Yeah, I've been I've been in some networks before, uh, also uh, in in, um, yeah, in in like-minded contexts, for example, and of course also in data journalism, it's really a culture that is influenced by the open data culture, and it's really about col collaboration in in every regard. Um, and I also think that journalism is changing um, or has been changing during the last years. I mean, even investigative journalists are collaborating. And this is really, uh, really a good sign. And in the background, when it comes to product development, for example, or experts of certain fields uh, where there is only one or two in every newsroom, they are, of course, collaborating um, and exchanging experiences um, and um, there are conferences, so so it was a natural thing to join um, the network, of course, because my impression is also that we are all uh, on the same page. We are all working, um, uh, yeah, this, with the same challenges, and and they are of course influenced by the market and by our competitors. But it's more um, like like quest bigger bigger questions like uh, what are we doing in this um, dynamics. Um, of the um, inf info, sy info system uh, that we have online, for example, or the interplay between platforms and stakeholders and the public. So it's it's really a different context that we are fighting in and where the challenges are, and it's not primarily the market or the competitors, I think. So um, I think culture has changed, uh, and and um, I think the collab shows that that we can um, yeah change it even further. In a good way. Great. And Agnes, have you felt as well this change of culture, this sort of new era filled with uh, collaboration? I, I agree with it. I, I'm not old enough to have lived in the old era, I think, but 
uh, for me with the with the current market and with this global information market that we have, news media organizations are required to collaborate. Uh, as Charlie said, we can't do it on our own. With that said, uh, we're very happy to do these types of collaborations because they really spur innovative practices back home as well. What I believe makes AI is such a powerful topic for collaboration for newsrooms is that it's rarely the models or the technologies themselves that are the competitive advantage, at least not for, for news media companies, uh, but it's the organization's ability, readiness, if you would, to use these tools, uh, to feed them with new data, to, uh, to have an organization fit to work with them, act upon the insights generated by them. Uh, so I think that enables us to collaborate around AI in a really trusting, transparent way because we know uh, it's not the technologies themselves that we are competing with or around. I think uh, Mattia Peretti and Charlie, of course, of LSE and the Journalism AI platform are doing an exceptional job uh, in reminding us of uh, the power of sharing and, and discussing openly. So it's a very it's a very trusting platform to be part of. Thank you very much. And you're right, big up to Mattia Peretti, the project manager of Journalism AI, um, for also leading the charge and really helping organize all this collaborative effort. So thank you very much. Uh, extremely happy to have you all and uh, looking forward to the result of this collaboration because um, we'll be very excited to see um, the outcome of this work uh, in a few weeks. Thanks, everyone, um, and uh, good luck with uh, uh, the project. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you to all our amazing speakers for your wonderful insights and perspectives. And thank you for tuning in. You can view all the episodes in this series on our YouTube channel.